Good morning, everybody, and welcome to episode three of this series of webinars, which is Crystal Clear Complex Cases. Today, I'm joined by two special guests. We've got Roger Morris, Group Distribution Director for One Savings Bank. And again, we've got the tax wizard, which is John McCaffrey from Alexander & Co. And for those of you that don't know me, my name is Dan Morris, Key Account Director at Crystal Specialist Finance. Morning, gents. How are we? Very well. Morning. Morning, Dan. How's everybody else out there? Warm welcome. That's it. That's it. So first of all, if you are joining us for the first session of this series, then welcome. Hopefully you find it useful. And for those of you that are returning, thank you for coming back. So as always with these webinars, there's no set agenda. So what we discuss is purely down to the audience. So please do, if you've got any questions, whether it's a tax related question, it's a specialist finance related question aimed at myself, Roger, John, whatever, please do fire away. And the beauty of these sessions are the fact that we've got three, I suppose, experts from different fields within the industry. So you've got myself from a broker point of view. You've obviously got Roger from a lender point of view. And then you've got John from a tax point of view. So it's a triple pronged attack in terms of the answers you'll get for all these questions. And hopefully um, you do benefit and you do get the answer you're looking for. And more than anything, have a bit of fun on this session and gain a, a wealth of knowledge, I'd like to think. So, um, yeah, so for those of you that don't know, John, John, do you want to introduce yourself in terms of you and your business and what you do? Yeah, no worries. Um, I'm John McCaffrey. I am tax partner at Alexander & Co. Uh, we're a boutique practice up in Manchester. Um, we deal with entrepreneurs of all types and descriptions, uh, including um, property owners, both commercial and residential. Um, and we basically deal with their tax issues and problems and try and make them as efficient as we can be. Perfect. That's it. That's a nice short answer from you as well. So brilliant. Thank you very much for that. But honestly, John is a, as I've mentioned, a wizard. I do joke about that, but he really is an expert within his field. So honestly, any questions tax related now or in the future, if you want to link up with him, this isn't a blog or a sales pitch. He's brilliant at what he does. So please do get in touch um, and potentially build that relationship there. I don't need to introduce Roger. Obviously, everyone knows, or most of you will know Roger. He's like a stray cat. He's everywhere. Uh, very well known within the industry, so we'll leave that there. But yeah, I mean, why we started these sessions back at the beginning of the year was purely because of the stamp duty, the deadline that was looming and looking at solutions for your clients and how we can essentially get them to beat that deadline, benefit from the tax relief um, and get them in their dream homes or their investment property, whatever, before the, tax, the stamp duty deadline. Now, as we've discussed on these sessions previously, and that's been in the papers, all we've done is we've kicked that deadline down the road so the deadline is again looming we've got what six to seven weeks before the first phase of it where the actual threshold drops and i suppose guys what are your thoughts i know previously we said that we weren't expecting the dead the deadline to be extended and it was but this time around what are your thoughts on that do you think it will be don't you john do you want to go first i will um I have to say, at this time, I don't think it will be extended. Uh, there is a set plan for not only the deadline to it's not end, it's be tapered off. So um, end of June, the stamp duty holiday applies to £500,000 properties. Um, following that, it goes down to £250,000 properties um, till the end of September. Um, in the things I'm reading, the press I'm seeing, the, 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 the stuff coming out of the Treasury, there's not even a whisper that it's going to change. Um, there's no rumour, so I, I, on this occasion, don't think it's going to go any further. Perfect, thank you for that. So, from my, my point of view, I, I think the first deadline, I actually just want to, I think it's just worthwhile uh, mentioning to everybody listening to dear Dan, is, is actually not stamp duty, but it's the 31st of May, which is the end date for phase one of help to buy. So if you are dealing with help to buy at the moment and you have got cases that you are struggling to get over that line that I really do sort of empathise with you because that is an absolute deadline that if you don't pass by that date, you literally can't proceed full stop. So again, that's, that's the really point. If you are dealing with those um, phase one of help to buy, then that's going to be a really important next couple of weeks or less than two weeks now to get that sorted. When we look at the stamp duty deadline, um, I think if I had customers, let's just say I've got two customers I'm dealing with independently. I've got John, who's purchasing a house for £249,000. 
in Manchester. If John doesn't hit the deadline on the at the end of June, then it's not going to affect John because of that next stage down. But Dan, Dan's buying a property in London for half a million pounds and Dan needs to hit that deadline. But it's not just about the deadline. It seems to be this intense pressure. And I'm speaking as a residential point of view, not as a buy to let, but the residential market, there's a fear of missing out. There's a fear that if Dan doesn't complete, he loses 15 grand, but that house might have gone up by 30 grand, but that's irrelevant. He's going to miss out. So there is a, a real pressure at the moment. When properties come on the market, and, and my experience is, is around Birmingham and, and, and my experience in the Northeast, and, and Dan, I think, will back this up, is the fact when properties come on the market, that day you might have eight viewings and that property will go and potentially we will go for maybe five grand more than the asking price of which maybe the people buying might have to use that as cash, um, not even mortgageable because the lenders or the valuers won't value it. So you've, you've got a real amount of pressure. And then there's also the emotive reason of when you want to move and that you don't want to lose that property. And there's an awful lot of people downsizing. So you, we, we got an example at the moment. Um, I, I won't give away any personal details, but we've got a case that's going through um, Crystal at the moment, which is a customer who purchased a house in 1973. There's about half a million pounds worth of equity. He needs to move times against him for personal reasons. And I don't know if he was, if he was, around now he would happily come on here and actually share his experience he needs to move by the end of june not because of the stamp duty he just needs to move by that that date he's got personal reasons and then there's also the fact that you might have a, maybe a couple who's pregnant that needs to move and the need that that rigidity that crystal can give so i think it'd be understanding from dan now that um, and I'm going to ask you this question. You've got a couple, doesn't matter who, but let's just say a couple, and they need to move, but they want the assurity of moving on a date that they can define. And it's about, is bridging, is it expensive? And I always think it's, it's retrospective. You know, if you want a three-month bridge to borrow 200 grand, it might cost you £2,000 in interest as a, a rough ball figure. Some people would happily pay two grand to get the assurity of moving and knowing they're going to secure that house, that they're frightened that the, the owners might re-put on the market, Dan. And I know you're experiencing a lot of that, where you're doing an application, suddenly find the customers had the house sold from underneath and because of gazumping. So where would you, how would you summarise this to brokers listening in now about the need to really start to think about swapping the direction of travel? Yeah, so I, th I think everyone's aware, and it's no secret, that there is a bottleneck at the moment in terms of residential mortgages with the high street lenders, and even lenders like yourself, let's be honest, from a precise point of view, any residential lender in the market, people are inundated with transactions, regardless of what level you are at, lenders are inundated with transactions. Yes, look, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss COVID, and we'll, we'll briefly touch on it, and yes, people are still working from home, you've got your dogs back in the background, obviously we're sat at home at this moment in time, but with that, obviously, the SLAs have fell, which means that you've got people working from home. You haven't got access to some of the tech you might have had access to with working in the office. You've then got the added pressure from the stamp duty deadline and the transactions within the market being essentially an all-time high. Mix that together, then, yeah, there is that bottleneck. So I do think that people, again, need to start looking at the likes of bridging finance to not so much beat this deadline, but get them where they want to be within life because what we've learned over the past 12 months is we take a lot of stuff for granted whether it's family whether it's you've moved like yourself you live what 200 miles away from me at the moment yeah certain chances are different now and you know what you're not of an age where you want to spend time with your grandkids and you're not working and you're retired and for people like that time is precious so rather than waiting for say your property to sell and then using the cash that you've got within that property to buy a property further north a lot of people are coming to us now and saying, do you know what's important to me? It's not the money. It's not the cost. It's actually spending 
the rest of my years or what time I've got left, not at the day at this point in time, with my family, the quicker I can get to them and closer to them and spend that time that I've missed out on over the past 12, 18 months, then that's important to me. All right, well, bridging finance, you can move within the month, within two weeks. We can essentially complete bridging finance. If a case came in today, we could complete it by Friday, so potentially even tomorrow or Thursday, depending if we've got the ducks in a row. So it's definitely there to serve a purpose. And it's not just about saving people money. It's about saving time more than anything. And again, time's, time's precious. And a lot of people have lost people this past year. So it's not all about money and a financial gain or financial saving, so to speak. So yeah, it's brilliant from a stamp duty point of view because you are breaking that chain. You are not having to wait for that residential mortgage to complete, which again, at the moment, I think time scales you're looking at potentially what three to four months to complete so now if you are only four weeks down the line with certain lenders and you haven't got the best solicitor in the world that isn't the most um, quick and proactive then you're going to miss that deadline or that first stage of the deadline but again it's not about all the time saving money it's about the speed and efficiency um, and it's not expensive I mean bridging finance is expensive short-term finance isn't it's exactly the same thing it's just worded differently isn't it mm. so from a yeah. from a I suppose historic and legacy point of view, you'll get a lot of brokers and clients out there from maybe five, 10 years ago that was stung by these cowboy lenders. And obviously yeah. you, you're you not one, and you've never been one, but they've charged up from fees and then they'd, they'd set off at the sunset in the Ferrari and kill the deal and it was never going to go anywhere. Or they were charged maybe 15% for that year with a two, three, four percent fee in and then a 2% fee out. It's not like that these days. You can get bridging finance for what, sub 5%. Um, which is just phenomenal. And again, it's, it's weighing up the pros and cons as to do you want speed with a little bit of cost or actually do you want to wait for three, four, five, six, whatever months, have that cost incurred anyway um, and actually put your life on hold and, and potentially miss out on this dream home or whatever that transaction may mean to you. So again, it's weighing up the pros and cons. But as people know, and a lot of people on this webinar will know, we are, I'd like to think the best within the market from a broker point of view. And we certainly do the most transactions and we won't be beating on bridging the finance. So again, it's something to bear in mind and we'll send out after this. But I can't yeah, even so remember what the question was. I think what, what so anybody listening in today that's never used bridging finance, I've, I've used it for about 30 years of my life or worked with brokers for 30 years. What I'll be saying now is if you've got a customer, you've got to sit down and work out what are their priorities if they feel that the chain is taking too long and that they the, the customer's end property could be lost because they can't complete as quickly as the seller wants, then it's important that you at least give consideration to an option number two. By doing literally a two or a three page decision in principle with Crystal, they, they won't even make a hard footprint. They're able to come back and give you considered terms that will work out what it will cost. So first, what is the priority of, of keeping that property? Secondly, if you were able to complete in a week or two weeks, how quickly would their current house sale go through? Now it's estimated that potentially it might only be another eight weeks longer because of delays in chains. And it's not just a stamp duty. Now, £200,000 roughly would cost about £1,000 a month in interest. So it could, just on an interest point of view, cost £2,000 to be able to give the assurity of getting that end house that apparently might not be, you're not really bothered where you live, but you are. So if you've got a designated one-off house that just doesn't come on the market, that you feel that like you might going to lose out for your customer, then it's worth really doing that decision in principle and being able to give your customer that, that informed choice. Now, even if they don't use it, they're going to think that, wow, this guy is really been, or this lady's really been looking at different options for me. So I just think it's worth keeping that in the mind. And I think the reason me and Dan wanted to bring it up is because you've really just got to keep looking at the different options. You'll be under a lot of pressure next month. The legal world's going to be under a lot of pressure and if a customer's saying, I don't care what it is, I don't want to lose that house, obviously cost does matter and it's got to be reasonable, then at least challenge Crystal to work out an option B for your customer. And I think that's worth doing, Dan, yeah? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And again, a question is just coming, which I'll, I'll mention in a second. It's a good question. But 
It's about providing all the options and putting all the options on the table and saying, look, what is important to you, as you mentioned? And do you want to be at the end of June? If you do want to be at the end of June, then potentially look at bridging finance because it could be the only solution, which brings on nicely to um, the question that's came in. So thank you for this one. It's an anonymous question. But the question is, when will bridging be the only option left to take advantage of the stamp duty deadline? Or is it already the only option? Now, it's kind of, you don't know really. It's, it's how long's a piece of string. It yeah. depends which lender, what solicitor, what value, and if there's anything that's going to be hidden or any anything that's going to cause complications. I think for me, I think to play it safe, I think you're probably looking at maximum within four weeks. I think obviously four weeks from inquiry right way through to completion is going to be an absolute challenge. I think realistically, you're going to be looking at six because, again, from my lending days from HSBC, which were really, really quick, um, you'd look at six weeks for an average transaction to be done, and that's that's pre-COVID and that's when the market was relatively not so much flat, but the transaction levels weren't as high. And then you've got third parties as well. So a lot of solicitors, I mean, I'm dealing with a solicitor at the moment, which from a personal point of view is absolute garbage um, and they don't get back to you. So it really, really depends on the third parties you've got involved in the transaction. But I think to be safe from my point of view, my opinion, obviously this isn't crystals again, I'd probably say, Anywhere between four to six weeks, certainly no less than four weeks to look at to look at doing that bridging. Yeah, do you know I, I backed Dan up on that. Um, Dan's helping me refinance one of my buy to lets, and we've got an offer out very quickly, but the lawyer just won't respond. And it was a lawyer that was recommended to me and Dan part of the deal. It wasn't our choice, and this offer will potentially run out. Nothing from trying but literally because the focus wasn't there. So the, what I would say with Dan's point is, and the bit that Dan can't know, if it's a lender that needs to get local searches that can't indemnify, it's about understanding where those searches are uh, mm -hmm. and making sure that time frame can come through. Now, we've got a couple of questions coming in, Dan. Let, let, me, let me read out John's to you because I'd like to get your take on this, unless you want me to give a take on it. And then <laughs> we're going to ask our John, because he'll have a view potentially on this. And then we've got a good question that's coming on the email that I want to hear John McCaffrey's view on as well. So do you want me to read this one to you, Dan, or do you want to read it to me? Which way do you want to go? Because Just read I, it to me if you want. Read it to me. Read it to you, because I'd like to hear your view on this. So this is from John. John, good morning. Um, would bridging finance be suitable for an UK expat returning to employment in the UK enable them to rebuild their credit identity over a six to 12 month prior to applying for a standard mortgage? Right, now that is, that's a brilliant question. Now, I'll give you my opinion, obviously Roger can give you his, but no, um, in my opinion, that wouldn't be acceptable. The reason being, so there's a few key things from bridging finance in terms of questions. So what's the asset worth? How much do you need against it? And the most important one, what's the exit? Now, if your exit, is essentially going to be a residential mortgage, then you're going to need a decision in principle in place prior to getting the finance agreed. Because it's a regulated transaction, we need to make sure that you can actually exit that, that finance agreement. So it could be all well and good saying, right, they're going to rebuild the credit and then they're going to get a residential mortgage after that 12-month period or six months or whatever that may be. But if we can't get something solid day one saying, right, you've got a dip from precise HSBC, wherever that may be, then unfortunately not. So let's 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 say they can currently get a residential mortgage, but it's not with the, the best lender out there. As long as you get a dip in place for that particular lender, which that product's available to that client, then yes, we could do it. And actually nine months down the line, you could re-dip it with a better lender and then get the finance approved, then fine. But the needs, if the exit's going to be refinanced, we need a dip in place prior to that finance completing, just to make sure they can exit that deal. Because it's a regulated transaction, then we need to make sure that they can exit it. Otherwise, we're stuck in that bridge in finance, has to go to repossession potentially, or um, huge fees are charged, then ultimately the lender's got no leg to stand on because they didn't have that dip in place or that exit from that property. So in theory, yes, but no. <laughs> my view from precise mortgages point of view it, it wouldn't meet our criteria and my understanding of the regulator the regulator wouldn't specifically like this type of approach john 
The reason being is bridging does cost substantially more than term lending. And it's about understanding that journey, the customer. So they would be better off returning back to the UK and utilizing maybe one of the specialist lenders on Dan's panel that might take a view. It, it depends on where they are now, what country they're in and who they're working for. So let's say they're working for Shell in the Middle East and we can actually see an employment track record returning back to Shell in the UK, then that in itself, potentially, there's a number of lenders would look at that. But let's just say that they're living in one of the countries that's on the questionable list when it comes to deposit and where their deposit would come from. That in itself can give an awful lot of lenders a lot of problem with where your deposit had actually originated from. Because a lot of lenders now really want the deposit just to originate from inside the EU. So there's an awful lot of, of issues on that. But using bridging in six to 12 months, that I don't think is going to give you a long enough period to be able to guarantee you're going to get a term exit. And that could have a detriment to the customer's um, ability to sustain those payments and the costs involved. So one to watch from me and one really to pursue a long-term basis. John, any viewpoints from your point of view on the tax side? Yeah, it's um, over the last five years or so, the, the government's got pretty big on non-residents buying UK property and they are generally actively trying to discourage it. Um, so in terms of an expat coming back, what you need to be really careful of is where you are resident when you make the purchase. Um, if you are considered a non-resident, there's now an additional 2% stamp duty charge over and above all other stamp duty charges, and that includes the additional rate. So you could find yourself with a 5% additional stamp duty charge going on. Um, <laughs> just a couple there he is. <laughs> if you there are, you go, John. This me, even <laughs> I, the stamp duty lover, forgot that one. So that's a really good one, John. Go on. If you're a non-resident selling UK property, um, previously it was a fact, and I think most people are aware of this, but it's worth a quick reminder. Uh, previously, you um, didn't have to uh, pay UK capital gains tax. From 2015, April 2015, you now pay um, UK capital gains tax if you're a non-resident on the disposal of residential properties, but only on any gain you've made since 2015. So if you've got any non-resident clients who haven't got any evidence of the 2015 value, uh, they should think about getting it. Um, and similarly, from April 2019, the same rule applied to uh, commercial properties. Um, so, but again, as I say, it's only on the value from April 19 that you pay the tax. So it's worth getting some sort of value put on your properties if you're a UK, I'm oh, sorry, a, a non-resident. Wow. Well, John, that, um, as per usual, I didn't even think that Leicester Field was stamp duty, which is another great point. So we've got another question that's come in from Ian Clark from Gateway Investments. Uh, Ian, thank you for your question today. Now, I'm going to ask this first to you, Dan, then to you, John, and then I'll give my five pennies afterwards. So this was Ian's question. We have seen an opportunity where there are two properties for sale with garden and land on one title and footprint, the purchase price is 325,000 pounds. The questions are two of them. First one, if we wish to purchase, would lenders be able to provide funds? And if we're looking to use one as our main residence and let the other one out, preferably on a self-catering short-term let basis. And the second question, one of the properties needs no work and can be moved in straight away. That would provide, I assume, the residential home, but the other would require a light refurb before letting out. If this is doable, what are the tax requirements? We assume it would be the best to run through a company, question mark, for record keeping. Please advise. Dan, do you want to take that first before we go to the wizard? Yeah, yeah, we'll be all about Harry in a second. Um, yeah, so I think there's a number of ways to do this ultimately. So it really depends on, first and foremost, well, it doesn't really depend, but one of the solutions does. 
how much of that property is actually going to be owner occupied or used for personal use. So obviously if it, if it passes a certain threshold, then it will be classed as either regulated or non-regulated dependent. Now that's one solution. You can have it all in one title still, and there'll be a few lenders that will be available within the marketplace to do that. Um, and you could purchase that on the standard conventional, I suppose, term loan. The other solution, which you probably know what I'm going to mention to you now, will be purchasing the property via a bridge, splitting the title upon completion to then have your residential regulated property uh, of that. And then obviously the non-regulated holiday let. Um, do your refer work to whichever one. And then you could refinance them both out to obviously term loans. Now, there's, there's, there's a lot of really good lenders in the marketplace at the moment for holiday lets. There's a guy on the screen, which you can see, um, right there, which obviously has a fantastic holiday let product. But in a nutshell, yes, the finance can be raised. I'd say you're looking at 75% LTV. It's probably going to be more beneficial for you to actually split the titles, purchase it on a bridge, complete the works to the standard which you want, then refinance out to your more mainstream lenders for the residential purchase. So look at the high street for that. And then obviously look at doing the holiday let element with the likes of Interveer, which again have some fantastic products and rates available for you at the moment. That would be my opinion and my suggestion, so to speak. But in a nutshell, yes, it can be achieved. Who wants to answer next? Do you want to go at the wizard or do you want to put wizard. your No, go at the wizard. It'll be a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go up at the kettle. Hang on, hang on. Ian, Ian, listen, John's now going to give you some real good advice to so have a pen and paper handy and focus on his every word. Right. So this is one of these circumstances whereby there's no set answer. Um, how you structure this will be very much down to the circumstances of the purchaser. Okay. And I'll try and break it down and keep it as, as relatively straightforward as I can. But it's these simple queries that generally have a great deal of tax issues in them. Okay. So one, you're buying a property that is going to be your main residence, okay? You need to think about now and you need to think about the future. If you're thinking about the future, you want to make sure that you're going to get your main residence relief on sale. So you absolutely do not want the main residence part in a company. If you're going to separate, you only want the holiday let in a company. Okay. Secondly... If you're going to put the holiday let in a company, you need to do it at completion. If you don't do it at completion, you're paying a second lot of stamp duty. And what I mean by that is, one, you've got a stamp duty purchase, stamp duty cost on the purchase of the whole property. And then you've got another stamp duty cost if you then transfer part of your property into a company. So you've got a more stamp duty than you need to pay. The other thing to be aware of on stamp duty is if you then are going to purchase the holiday let into a company, you'll have an additional 3% charge because the company always pays an additional 3% charge. This is assuming the holiday let, it's at a light refurbish, so I assume it's capable of being a dwelling at the moment. Um, if, it was more than a, if it was more than a light refurbish, if it wasn't a dwelling yet, you, you, you wouldn't be paying the additional rate charge. Okay. Then you've got to look at, is a company actually worthwhile? So a company, I mean, anybody can keep records um, and you can use an accounting system to keep, uh, or in an Excel spreadsheet, something like that, to keep records about any form of sole trader business, right? You, you keep a receipt of your income and your expenses and you return it on your tax return as a sole trader. The reason generally you use a company is either you feel the need for limited liability, so you feel you're personally exposed and don't want to have that personal liability, but that is quite frequently covered by insurance. The other issue is actually it turns out to be more tax efficient for you overall to have it in a company, right? To work that out, you need to run the figures. So if the buyers are basic rate taxpayers. And if the rental income would keep them within the basic rate tax band, and that's 50 grand of income, all four sources of income, taxable in a tax year, 
there's little point in having a company. It's an unnecessary admin. Um, and it would create additional costs because you would pay tax in the company and then you'd pay additional tax as you tried to extract it. If you're just over the 50 grand, it may be worth paying the additional tax um, rather than having the company set up. Um, companies come with a bunch of costs. Uh, there's accounts, there's corporation tax returns, there's filings, okay? But if you are substantially within the higher rate bracket, a company is generally the way forward if you don't mind the admin of them. Um, but as I say, just be aware, you, you've got reporting obligations, you've got filing obligations with your, your accounts, your corporation tax return, um, and that kind of thing. The final piece to this is whether or not it's a furnished holiday let or not, okay? And there are very specific tax rules about falling within the furnished holiday let regime. If you fall within the furnished holiday let regime, um, the disposal of that element of your property, whether from the company or the shares in the company, once you've held it for a couple of years, currently qualifies for a 10% rate of tax. If it doesn't, then when you sell, you're looking at a 28% rate of tax. Now, the other thing I would do in these circumstances, just a final piece, is because you're getting the one property and you've given a global price, it would be really useful if you're able to split the purchase price between the two elements. Because when you're doing your calculations on your disposal in the future, you'll then know what gets allocated to what. And you'll be able to work out and not have any issues with the revenue as to what the gain should be. Quite a lot to take in there. But as I say, it is, it is a, the, the, these situations do give rise to some fairly complex tax issues. That, that's it. And that, again, that's a, a very long answer, but a very educational and informative answer. And that just kind of solidifies why people need to be joined with people like yourself to yes. give, that, give that correct advice. Otherwise, you're left with a liability which you hadn't thought of ultimately. So, Indeed. no, that's brilliant. Hopefully, that covers the uh, well, question. Or, yeah, do, do one of the things I would just say approaching this from um, my own point of view, um, Ian, when I've um, done something like this, is, is imagine you, you've got. A piece of land and you got your two properties what ultimately you, you would get to get the best end valuation on the residential and on the holiday let would be have a value turn up who can visualize the separation so by being able to own the property and have some form of demarcation between the two properties so you might want to erect a fence down the middle you might need to have planning to have separate driveways. It could be a shared driveway, but with a division. So you can visually, from a security point of view on the residential, see a defined boundary and the service is being split. And that becomes important. And the holiday let on its own newly created title, which, which will eventually happen, that the services are split there and there's a, a separation because if it was where the holiday let is right next to the main house, could there be, you know, you've you got a load of humans in having a, a, a weekend away. Would that have a detrimental effect if it was sold off separately to the main house because of, of noise or car parking or disruption or dispute further down the line? So what you need to do is, is I haven't, I can't see the plans. Ideally, you'd want quite a bit, a bit of separation between the two. Or if they are together, it's just about how lenders will approach it. I know Nationwide used to do a holiday let in the garden of the main house, um, but it's different lenders have different views about what you ultimately want. From an interview point of view, we are very happy to lend on holiday lets. And we have um, the option of doing it in personal names or a limited company. Now, if you were wanting to proceed in a limited company, it's about listening to what John's advice about on completion, you'd need the title split and you'd be having to lend on the two separate division, the two separate properties to do the renovation before you would then go to a term lender facility on the holiday and on the residential. So there's a bit of work, but a planning and a bit of division, if that's the right answer, or maybe speak to someone like John first to get your direction and travel of what you want to do. 
uh, and hopefully that the perception or the views between the three of us may have helped you with that particular question. Right, Dan, have we got any more questions come in? Yes, yeah, so there's one on the screen. I've just got one coming as well. So from, I suppose from an interview point of view, are there any options for holiday let borrowing where the applicant has no previous experience? So that the, the, when it comes to in the Bay commercials viewpoint on that, we do need the applicant to have had experience. And ideally you want the property that's been marketed and rented out before because starting a holiday let from new at the moment isn't an easy, um, it, it's the most costly part of getting to profitability. So I go out today and I buy a holiday let somewhere, well actually the number one town in the UK for holiday lets is Whitby. There you are, Selcombe is number two. So me and Dan, we're going to buy a property in Whit Whitby, a ball tall, a nice little holiday let overlooking the harbour. So we buy that today and we market that. Realistically, we're going to have a slow six months in that first kind of first season, which is this year. And then we start really to build bookings for next year. However, if Dan and I could purchase a holiday let that was already established, it had bookings, we're buying the asset and the income that's coming from that. So we prefer in the big commercial, the existing holiday let journey and that the landlord's got experience because of rental voids and, and, and it's understanding a holiday let is not a buy to let, it is a business. And when buying a holiday let, you're not su subject to your standard rates, it's, it's business rates. And, and a conversation with John is, is really important there is lenders out there that will consider holiday let as a as a as a sort of a first time investment as like um, Kent Reliance will allow your first time ever buy to let to be a HMO but Dan will be able to answer those questions if you want to name those lenders or send a decision in principle in and actually assess the landlord themselves Dan yeah no, that's it it's about access accessing um reviewing I suppose the client and the proposition and what they're looking to do but there is absolutely lenders out there there's a few lenders that will do um holiday lets us with no experience no no previous say holiday or even buy to let experience absolutely fine but again I'm kind of touching on what Roger said rate will reflect the risk so also if they've never done it before and they don't have this experience and they want to do it absolutely fine but you might be looking at your higher end of the scale in terms of the rates that are offered um Again, as, as, you, as Raj mentioned, it could be down to location, and it's also down to the fact that if it's not an established holiday let, then, again, there's a lot of lenders out there that may not like that and may not want to do that. But the beauty of the specialist finance sector is anything's possible. As long as you've got the deposit available, which is required, which typically you're looking at, what, 30, sorry, 25 to 30% LCV, then, yeah, it, it's absolutely possible, but rate reflects the risk. So it could be the case of, if they are a first-time landlord, or even first-time buyer, so to speak, buying a, a holiday let, again, it can be achieved, but the rates can affect the risk. So don't expect your, your better rates, like, say, the interbase um, of this world. You could be looking at 6 7%, but it's an A to B solution, isn't it? And that's what a lot of the specialist finance world is. Just quickly, I know, I know another one just came in live there, but to really review to, and, and John, this is going to put you to the test, and, and even you, Roger, to be fair, I had it yesterday, and I've... I've I have absolutely no idea, but help to buy ICES where you get the bonus from the government. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, still with me, good. A client is purchasing a property from, from auction and requires bridging finance. Are they allowed to, one, obviously they can use the ISA, but two, will they get the bonus on top of that, given the fact they're purchasing it via bridging? I have no idea what's on my head. <laughs> So I, I would, first of all, the help to buy ISA was launched by the government and to be eligible, it's about purchasing a residential home. And it's, it's a, an incentive to assist the ability to raise the deposit. And now we've got a universal ISAs. So I, I'm going to give you a, cal a calculated um answer but you would need to go and check it out so you're buying on bridging i assume it's for residential yeah 
Absolutely. So bridging is just a word. It's a facility to purchase a home. So the fact that you are buying a house, a residential home, is the ultimate simplification of what's occurring. The fact you're buying it from auction is irrelevant. And you help to buy ISA wasn't just for brand new properties. It was for the provision of a deposit savings scheme to purchase a new home. So if you were to go and Google the help to buy ISA rules, I think it would set out in my guesstimated opinion that that would be eligible as long as it was for your home, that I believe the government would support that because it wasn't just about um, of, of, of giving funding just to new build properties, it was really to any properties. And that's what the universal ICE is about now, which the eligibility, the money's got to be used for a deposit for a residential home. So that, that would be me calculate. I can't give you the absolute surety, but I believe that that would be fine, Dan. Right. I'll say that said Google search agrees with Roger. But what, what, so in that instance then, what's to stop them buying that house at auction and then six months on the line selling it? Obviously, you're going to have to retain that asset for a period of time, I mean, in theory. And there's got no, to be well, that gap there, there? Well, it's, it's very similar to if you're using uh, any of the help to buy uh, programs that are in England, Scotland, and Wales is you can purchase a property using help to buy, using forces help to buy, and the government help to buy ISA. All of that. And then if you do have to then six months down the line sell the property, you've got your ERCs on your mortgage and you have to then repay the loans. But I don't think anybody is going to buy a property at auction with the fees involved just to get the government bonus of, in effect, what's about a thousand pounds. Yeah, well, that's it, maximum of three grand, isn't it? No, that's fine, that's fine. Um, we'll get some clarity on this. Didn't know if you had a full, full clarity on it, but let's get back to some more questions. And this fits in pretty well with the pictures we've seen on LinkedIn of you studying <laughs> Um, So for those of you that obviously are on LinkedIn, you'll have seen Roger with a Pretty decent chocolate cake, um, covered in chocolate. And yeah, so it's to do with top slicing, believe it or not, which is very much all over socials and the news at the moment. But is top slicing still possible and realistic as an option? Or have lenders lost some appetite with this over the past year? So I've actually been, we're getting a, a few, a couple of who are on today who will, I've asked to remain anonymous who've been asking me would I bring up top slicing? So let me just give you a bit of context. Joe Breeden wrote an article in Mortgage Introducer on Friday, which talks about the only area of the UK that's seen a compression in rent returns and, and a reduction in demand for buy-to-let property is London, and specifically that southeast. And that's been done specifically in London because when COVID-19 hit, young families who rented went back home. But at the same time, there was an estimated 78,000 properties on the short-term rental market in London to a point it was one in 50 houses. So those short-term lets, in effect, were, were null in their ability to be rented out. So they flooded the long-term rental market. So landlords at the moment who never had massive rent returns in London, who want to refinance the properties for all manner of reason, have a real problem at the moment their rental shortfall when the valuation takes place means in a lot of cases, they're not able to obtain the mortgage that they want, specifically two-year deals. So Precise Mortgages reintroduced its top slicing last week to great fanfare and a lot of positive responses from brokers. And I was just reading some of the key facts that we got on this is as long as the property can yield 100%, ICR as a standard, then we're able to consider what we class as EIR, which is estimated earned income revenue. So if you've got a customer that has a shortfall, you know, a 200,000 pound property, wants a 75% loan, and on a five-year fixed, 
it just gives them, say, 133 grand or a two year deal, 78 grand. Sometimes maybe about 300 pounds of disposable earned income would be sufficient enough to get them on either a two or a five year deal. So I think there's some there's some great value to consider as part of that overall product selection for your customers, Dan, that just might help you unlock either the southeast of England where they literally don't qualify for any deal or where landlords have requested a two-year deal and every lender is just locking them into five-year fixes. So something to look into. And if you want more details, then contact the Crystal Specialist Mortgage Desk and the guys there will help you evaluate the options. No, that's it. That's it. Because in theory, you've got potentially five select mortgage customers, which are yeah. um, prisoners, aren't you, as, as such? Because they've got that, the, the larger loan amounts from previous um, years when I suppose the rules and restriction were the type, but now they can't get off that SVR rate, which they've got with that lender, because purely they can't achieve that loan amount based on the actual rental. So no, it's good that it's back. Um, and again, there's been a lot of singing and dancing about it and lots of cakes getting eaten. So no, it's brilliant. So any 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 top slicing that you need, again, speak to us. And we're more than happy to point you in the right direction uh, and look at placing them cases. John, what do, just out of curiosity, what does top slicing mean to you? Ah, um, not the same thing at all. Top slicing is um, income tax on offshore bonds, where you get um, you get income tax relief based on your income over the past twenty years. There he is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just so a, Dan, little... Yeah, John always comes up with something new. Um, we, we've had um, um, we've had a lot of questions coming in, um, and and it's again, you know, Ian Clark. Just to come back to you, Ian, if you're looking at purchasing a property which has the ability to generate its own income, and it's a thing of beauty, um, where aside to your property, you've got in effect a little cash machine that every week you can go out and collect money off, which I call a holiday let or a short term let. Getting independent tax advice becomes really important. So I would, the two points I would say is maybe follow up with, have a conversation with John or someone mm -hmm. equivalent and, and have a conversation with Dan separately about debating those ideas, because the, if this is for yourself, it's an emotive solution and we always think a bit hazily when it comes to that but you're certainly on the right track where i live at the moment i have a, a two-bedroom coach house that we rent out privately you don't even know it's there and even though it's in effect connected to the main house there is a couple of things you have to think about when you go to renew your general house insurance and they say is it straightforward well not really it's got a it's got a holiday connected to it and, and, and it's got this and it's got that and it's got the other. There is plenty of solutions out there to get that, but you do need to follow that journey. So Dan, have you got any other key points? I know we're coming um, close to time that you think resonates with you that brokers are ringing in to you on an hourly and daily basis that that's on your desk right now that you think would be a good question to kind of close, not close off, but coming to the end of this this session um just anything what i would say is anything can be achieved within the specialist finance market and it absolutely is because it's common sense lenders like yourself which have a human approach it's not just a tick box exercise and that's your unusual property types it's your adverse credit cases it's your short-term finance it's your older clients it's you name it we'll look at it as long as it's fits within the parameters of the loan to value that's accepted and from an adverse credit point of view as long as there's nothing affecting the credit that's happened within the past six months essentially then anything's possible so you, even if you've got a client they've got really really heavy adverse credit stacks of ccjs and defaults as long as say there's nothing in the past six months or or 12 months then we can absolutely find a solution or it's that pig bread and breakfast which i'm not going to go into and which is the unusual property type or the the replica of the taj mahal is the tent as we've done or the the helipad or the fleet of airplanes honestly honestly anything's possible within a specialist finance market it really is and and again just we will uh, we will be there to hold your hands so whether it's a transaction you want to get involved in or not and just purely want to refer it on to crystal and collect the prop back end we can absolutely do that on a referral and introducer basis that's not a problem at all so if it's if it's if you're getting cases across your desk which one you simply haven't got time for 
two, you can't be bothered with, or three, you're actually being able to get on a plane now and get to the Bahamas or wherever, if it's green list, your country or whatever traffic light system is. Um, you can refer it to us, you can earn and, and refer, and you can have two sets of cases ongoing at the same time. You deal with the vanilla stuff or the stuff that you like dealing with, and we can deal with the really, the, let's be politically correct, um, interesting and quirky cases, shall we say, the stuff that you just don't want to get involved in or have a, we'll give you a headache, so to speak. So honestly, pick up the phone and use and abuse us from that basis. And then another thing, obviously, with us, three of us being on this call, get someone like John involved in your transactions because you get a lot of people still to this day which are moving properties from individual names to limited company names and they're just transferring it and they're not doing a sale and purchase and John you'll bang your head against the wall I imagine because you'll hear that all day long but bear in mind whether you are a tax advisor or not or you're not giving tax advice and you stress that to them you'll be held liable um, we've seen it people have been made examples of within the industry over the past few years since people have been transferring these properties to this limited company, even though it's a sale and purchase. And the broker always gets it in the neck. So I do honestly get linked up with someone like John. Doesn't have to be John. If you don't want to speak to a wizard, don't speak to someone else. Um, and just get the tax advice for your clients that they need. Because again, it will come back to bite you in the bum. And we've seen that so many times over the past couple of years. A broker seems to be giving tax advice. Oh, when it comes to the end of that transaction and it comes to completion day, well, actually, they've been asked for things like stamp duty, capital gains, which they haven't thought of, and it kills the transaction. So just, I'd say, do yourself a favour if you haven't already, link up with someone like John. Um, and that's pretty much it for my closing comments. Anything's possible, and link up with John. <laughs> um, I don't know about yourselves, guys, but, yeah, we've had some really good questions. I don't know if you want, you want to do a closing bit in terms of, from yourselves, and just summary of the day. John, you got anything to add? I do, and it's um, it, it 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 is about the deadline, really. It's um, I've seen a lot of incorporations over the last six months. People who are for a variety of reasons: uh, succession, inheritance tax planning, um, income tax planning, just generally looking to move um, properties into companies. Um, that comes usually with the stamp duty cost. And we are, irrespective of the finance available, the transfers, even if you don't need finance on those kind of transactions, because you can just, in a previous webinar discussion, move in a beneficial ownership, um, you, you, that structure can be put in place before the end of June. But you are rapidly running out of time to do that, um, purely from the point of fact of getting tax advice, getting legal advice, setting the structures up. Um, if you are going to or want to incorporate and take advantage of the stamp duty saving, you need to do it now. Yeah, that's a really good advice there, uh, guys, is, is understanding if you, you're going to set up trusts, you know, you've got the benefit of the stamp duty uh, rules at the moment. There's so many reasons. My, my summary is the following. Within your armory, health is like wealth. Always get more than one opinion or have specialists you can trust. So within your armory, do you have a relationship with a tax specialist? If you don't, then I think consider having one, but find one that you, you know and, and as much as possible, you, you understand the advice that they're giving. And secondly, have a relationship with someone like Crystal, because if you think, I've got a case... I'm going to go in this direction. Isn't it just quickly worth a decision in principle for a second opinion, just for a different point of view, just for your own file records? And for my understanding of working with Dan is when you go for a second opinion, it turns out to be the only opinion or the first opinion. So thanks everybody for listening today. And we're back on in June, Dan, and it is the 22nd of June. So, guys, thank you so much for taking the time from me and let Dan close off now. And thank you for, um, for joining. Yeah, thank you both for attending again uh, and for the little words of wisdom because there's been some great nuggets in there. So thank you very much. Yeah, just, just a summary from me. So Bridge and Finance. A lot of you will hear it won't get involved in it, but again, it's a, it's a solution there for your client and ultimately you are doing them an injustice if you aren't mentioning it to them at this moment, especially with that first stage of that deadline looming um, in the next kind of six to seven weeks. One thing I will mention is 
first and foremost, we won't be beating on non-regulated bridging. So send me any quote from the market first. I'll always beat that on a non-regulated basis. I'm not allowed to say it on the regulated side of things, but I'm pretty sure we can um, help you on that as well. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. So thank you very much for joining. Please come back for the next episode on the 22nd of June and we can look as to what's happened over the past month and where the market's at. Um, and what movements, what movements have been with the stamp duty and the transactions and overall busyness of the market. Obviously, all three of us will be on there. But, yep, yeah, stay safe. Enjoy the sun. Enjoy being able to have a bit more normality. And hopefully we will see you soon. Thank you both. Have a great day. Thank you. Take Bye. care, guys.